During the summer of 1978, Philip Derriman, an Australian journalist, strayed from the usual tourist route to visit the Oxfordshire village of Tackley. Later, in an item in Australia's leading newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald, he described Tackley as a sleepy old village, built largely of grey stone with long lines of high stone walls and a village green. He admired the well-maintained cottages on the attractive green and the splendid buildings erected in the early 1600s by John Harborne, the stables and dovecots, and through an archway the site of Harborne's house, long since burnt to the ground. But the clues Derriman was seeking were not to be found in these buildings. He knew from his researches in Australia that a number of people had left an English village called Tackley for Australia more than 130 years before and had later perished in Australia's greatest civil disaster. But was this the right village? He searched the church of St Nicholas in vain. There was no memorial to the dead emigrants. Perhaps he was in the wrong place after all. He knew the names of some of the emigrant families. Cook, Merry, Ryman, Hoare and Savings. And as he wandered round the churchyard, he found gravestones bearing some of these names. Encouraged, he sought out members of a local history group who had been studying old parish documents. And yes, there had been a mention of emigration, Derriman told the group that the ship on which the emigrants had travelled was named Ptaraki. The curiosity of the history group was aroused. This one piece of information led to a painstakingly detailed investigation, which revealed a most tragic tale. The story they uncovered took place in the year 1845, when life in the village was vastly different from today. Then the people who lived in Tackley also worked in Tackley. In the main, they were employed as farmhands by one of the local farmers, or as craftsmen such as Smith, Thatcher, Mason, Carpenter, Wheelwright or Baker. They had little cause or opportunity for travel, and a visit to Oxford or Banbury would have been an important event. Life for the average villager was governed by his employer, who housed and fed him, and the chapel or church who ministered to his spiritual needs. But those who had no employment had next to nothing. Their homes were often little more than hovels, their rent paid out of the poor rate. Their diet mainly consisted of oatmeal, root crops and green vegetables grown on their own vegetable plot, and perhaps the occasional piece of fat pork or mutton to boil with the cabbage on the open hearth, fuelled by faggots cut on tackly heath. Life was indeed hard for the pauper. In 1845, the main landowners and employers included these people, as the richer members of the community, they contributed most money to the poor rate, which was distributed by members of the vestry committee. This group was certainly not noted for its generosity, and when one sees that it was largely their own money that they were handing out, it is not difficult to see why. Among the paupers was James Cook, aged 27 in 1845, his wife Anne, aged 23, daughters Mary, aged five, Jane, aged two, and baby son John, just a few months old. James Cook's family are recorded in the charity lists on two occasions, a blanket valued at five shillings in 1843, and in 1844, a gown for Anne, value three and ninepence. Another family was that of Robert Hoare, aged 26, and his wife Emma, 23. Robert's father lived in Malthouse Cottage, while his wife's parents lived in a cottage alongside the Green. The Hawes may have lived in either of these houses, with their two children, Thomas, aged two, and Millicent, aged four months. Again, the records show that the Hawes received charity on several occasions. 
here a blanket valued at five shillings and threepence. Anthony Merry was 37 in 1845, his wife Edith 36. They had nine children, five boys and four girls ranging from six months to 16 years old. They all lived in just one half of this house and not surprisingly were frequent recipients of church charity. Here a gown valued at three shillings and ninepence. The fourth family, that of William Cook, lived in a cottage on the site now occupied by these bungalows. William and his wife Anne had six children aged between six months and 15 years old. Another family to benefit from the charity was that of John and Hannah Ryman and their three children. Here, six yards of calico costing ninepence and a shawl valued at eightpence. The five of them lived in a tiny nethercut hovel only part of the walls now remain, and vegetables grow where once the Rymans slept. John Savings had married widow Sarah Payne in August 1843, and they lived here in Medcroft Road. Sarah already had two children by her first marriage, Elizabeth aged five and Frederick four. The son of her second marriage, Philip, was just six months old. These, then, were some of the Tackley paupers. On Monday the 3rd of February, 1845, the Vestry Committee called a meeting, its purpose to resolve once and for all the burden these paupers placed on the parish, and in particular, it would seem, themselves. The solution was simplicity itself. The Cooks, Rymans, Hawes and Merrys would be encouraged to emigrate, we can only imagine the nature of the encouragement. Mr. Collins and Mr. Chilton were delegated to consult the authorities to obtain details and likely expense. The meeting was reconvened on Friday the 7th of February when the two men reported back on their discussions with the Poor Law Commissioners and on February the 13th a meeting of ratepayers and owners of property entitled to vote agreed to the borrowing of £150 to defray the expense of the emigration the loan would be repaid over five years out of the poor rate. Mr. Collins and Mr. Chilton were requested to meet the shipping agent and make preliminary arrangements. After this meeting, there was a delay in the written records until March the 6th, when the vestry decided, along with the other business, that the savings family should also be encouraged to emigrate. Although no mention is made of the Floyd family in the vestry minutes, it is evident that they too were to be included in the emigrant group. Stephen Floyd, his wife Hannah, and their two children, Mary and William, probably lived here with Stephen's widowed mother. This brought the total of emigrants to 42. The colonisation of Australia by transportation of convicts had almost ceased by the end of the 1830s, and by the mid-1840s, emigration from Britain was in full flood. Land in Australia was being sold to successful settlers and the money used to provide assisted passages for the new emigrants. In the January 18th edition of Jackson's Oxford Journal, this advertisement had appeared on the front page. Although the sailing date was stated to be March the 1st, the advertisement reappeared several times the last on March the 15th, when the sailing date was March the 31st. Although the ship is not named, it seems almost certain that this was the Katariki. In a short space of time, the Tackley paupers had been successfully encouraged, or perhaps persuaded would be a more accurate description. It's not difficult to imagine their feelings as they gathered up their pathetic bundles at the start of their journey to Liverpool, and said their farewells to their friends and relations. It's unlikely that they would have been expected to walk to Liverpool. Most likely they travelled by cart like this, either all the way or handed on from one town to the next. At the same time as they left Tackley, others from all over Britain, like these Irish emigrants, would have been starting a similar journey. The passenger list of the Katariki also shows families from villages near Tackley, such as Chesterton, Stonesfield, Stonesfield again, Fringford, 
Fritwell and Rousham. The advertisement in Jackson's Oxford Journal had done its work well. After several uncomfortable days' journey over the rough, unmetal roads, the Tackley emigrants arrived at Liverpool, still with time in hand. Around the docks were touts from the numerous lodging houses seeking business and traders plying their wares. Perhaps our emigrants bought a hot baked potato from a chap like this. As they waited out the few remaining days before Katariki sailed, they no doubt amused themselves by watching the activities along the Mersey. It was a new world to them. The Mersey was one of the main centres of Britain's overseas trade, and ships were everywhere, some berthed on mud at low tide, others crowded at anchor by the dockside, or in midstream where the passengers were rowed out by members of the crew. Wonders indeed to their innocent eyes. They watched in amazement as one of the newfangled steam tugs towed out a ship of several hundred tons. Up to 18 ships per day were leaving for the New World. Most were bound for North America, rather fewer for Australasia. The preparation of the Kataraki for her four-month voyage was now almost complete. This was to be her first trip to Australia, and her new captain, W.C. Finlay, had been selected for his honesty, sobriety and industriousness. The Kataraki was a good ship of her kind, a Canadian-built bark of 800 tons and less than five years old. She was rated A1 at Lloyd's and in preparation for her voyage had been overhauled completely, clad with new copper and reinforced with extra iron. She was 138 feet long and 30 feet across the beam. She would carry 369 passengers, in addition to the crew, in her single hold about 10 square feet of deck space for each emigrant. On the return journey, she would probably carry wool. Before boarding the ship, the emigrants were required to pass through a medical examination. By all accounts, provided you were able to walk past the medical examiner, you were pronounced fit for the voyage. At last, all was ready. On April the 20th, Kataraki weighed anchor and set out towards the open sea. The emigrants crowded the decks as she slipped away from England. No doubt they had misgivings in their hearts and could only wonder what the future might hold for them. As they met the open sea and for the first time perceived its vastness and felt its physical effect upon them, they went below. It would take at least a week to get their sea legs. By today's standards, the conditions below were unbelievable. Wide bunks had been constructed and were allocated one to each family, or two in the case of very large families. The toilet facilities were simply buckets. There was absolutely no privacy. The bilge water below them contained human and animal waste and remains of old cargoes. As the weeks proceeded, the stench below decks would be almost intolerable particularly in the hotter climates. Rats abounded and often crawled around the bunks as the passengers slept. During rough weather, the emigrants were confined to their bunks for many days. It was quite normal for the main deck and hull timbers to leak, saturating them with seawater, causing additional discomfort. As the emigrants journeyed on, the vestry committee in Tackley met again on May the 8th, ten weeks after that first meeting. Mr. Collins and Mr. Chilton handed in £25 balance. It seems that only £125 was actually spent, and the £150 loan was immediately paid off, although it seems unlikely that it was paid out of the poor rate. So the cost of ridding Tackley of its poor? £3 per head. But on the ship it was not all boredom and discomfort. Perhaps one of the Irish emigrants played a pipe or fiddle for the entertainment of the other passengers, as in this contemporary drawing. Certainly everybody seems to be enjoying themselves. 
With the assistance of the crew members, the passengers could follow the daily progress of their journey on the charts. The Katarika's charts included those produced during Darwin's voyage in the Beagle. The first leg of their journey took them to the Canary Isles, then probably to Rio de Janeiro, and on to the Cape of Good Hope, and then their final destination, Port Phillip, Australia. They would probably have stopped briefly to take on supplies of fresh provisions and water, but there would be no time for sightseeing. Speed was the essence, for the captain and crew would receive a bounty for the speedy and safe delivery of their charges. The fresh fruit and vegetables taken on at these ports of call provided a welcome supplement to their normal repetitive diet of oatmeal, biscuit, bread and salt fish or meat. During fine weather they could go up on deck and breathe the sea air, a welcome change from the claustrophobic atmosphere below. If they had brought any food with them, they could cook it for themselves, or the ship's cook would bake them a loaf for one penny, or a pie for a halfpenny, if they provided the ingredients themselves. Animals were always carried on deck during these voyages, and no doubt reminded our immigrants of home. There were cows, can you see one at the left of the picture? Sheep, goats, pigs and chickens, in this case in the lifeboat. On immigrant ships, the eggs and milk were reserved for the handful of first-class passengers, but the emigrants might occasionally get a fresh pork or mutton stew when an animal was killed, just like home, really. And so the voyage continued. By the standards of the day, it was uneventful, although one of the crew members was lost overboard on July the 4th, and only five children had died, as a later report records. On July the 21st, the weather became boisterous with gales veering from the northwest to southwest and continuous heavy rain confining the emigrants below decks for a fortnight. The bad weather had prevented the captain from ascertaining the ship's position accurately for four days, but on August the 4th, dead reckoning showed the Katariki here, about 70 miles from King Island, which lies in the Bass Strait between Tasmania and the Australian mainland. That night the ship hove to for eight hours, but by 4 a.m. she was underway again, driving before the gale. Later reports suggest that Captain Finlay had been criticised by the senior doctor for being overcautious in heaving to, and that in a moment of irritation he reversed his order and put the ship underway again. The calculations of the ship's position were disastrously wrong. The awful truth was that the Katariki was just a few miles from King Island, heading straight for the reefs on the island's west coast. At 4.30 on Monday, August the 4th, in pitch darkness, driving rain and a fearful gale whipping up mountainous seas, the Katariki struck the reef. The seas poured into the hold immediately to a depth of four feet. The screaming emigrants rushed in confusion to the ladders to escape onto the deck. Many did so before the ladders were knocked away by the working of the vessel, leaving those below shrieking and crying for help. By the strenuous efforts of the crew, about 300 of the emigrants were brought on deck, but many were swept overboard as the sea broke over the ship. At 5 a.m. the ship rolled onto her port side and the captain ordered the masts to be cut away in an attempt to get the ship upright, but to no avail. It was hopeless. The captain called to those on deck to cling to the wreckage till daylight. As day broke, they could see the land only 150 yards away. The only remaining boat was launched, but it was immediately capsized by the merciless seas. The waves continued pounding the ship, washing away passengers and drowning others who were lashed to the hull. In the late afternoon, the Katariki broke in half, and by the following morning, only about 30 people remained alive on the forecastle. At dawn on the 5th of August, the remainder of the hull started to break up rapidly, and the last of the passengers were taken by the sea. The rocks were strewn with mutilated corpses, yet miraculously, eight crew members and one immigrant, Solomon Brown, from Sutton in Bedfordshire, survived. William Blackstock, a 16-year-old apprentice, was amongst the surviving crew members, and he later made this sketch of the wreck entitled A Poor Lad Who Was Wrecked in the Katariki. The survivors were found by a party of seal hunters, led by Mr David Howey, 
who cared for them for five weeks until they could be taken off the island by a cutter named the Midge. Afterwards, John Fletcher, captain of the Midge, described the rocks. I stood upon a ledge of rock 40 feet above the level of the sea and found that over this had been driven by the sea the whole of the midship's part of the vessel, a mass of about 40 feet by 15 feet. David Howie wrote to the Lieutenant Governor of Van Diemen's Land asking to be employed to bury the dead. Money had been raised by the Queen Street Theatre in Melbourne and funds were made available to Howie to return to King Island and complete the burial. Nine years later, Howie revisited the graves with the Reverend Francis Nixon who drew this sketch of the burial site. Here, said Howie in a hoarse whisper, here I buried 245. It was just one year after that first vestry meeting when the news of the disaster finally got back to England. In the London Illustrated News, dated February the 7th, 1846, this small report appeared. The Katarake disaster was full of coincidence and irony. Thomas Guthrie, surviving first mate of the Katarake, returned to Australia one or two years later, now as captain of the brig Tigris. His ship went aground off South Australia, and Guthrie was drowned trying to get a lifeline ashore. Three years after the disaster, Solomon Brown, the sole surviving emigrant, was found dead in a couple of feet of water, and so the elements completed their toll. After the wreck, the government arranged for the erection of a monumental tablet at a cost of £25 overlooking the site of the disaster, where it still stands today. In 1979, after the melancholy story had been brought to light, funds were raised in Tackley to pay for an illuminated scroll to be displayed in the church. And here lies the final irony. This is the Tackley Parish Church of St Nicholas. St Nicholas is the patron saint of seafarers.